by overrun. Um, I'm going to hand over, um, without much ado, to, to Professor Charles Forsdick, who is going to introduce um, this afternoon's panel with Professor Dick Geary and Professor Nick Nesbitt. Um, just to let you know about timing and so on, we're, we're closing at 4.30, and if we could ask you to um, make your way towards the galleries if you're, if you're going to um, join the tour of the exhibition, and then we will... Um, transform the space into somewhere where we can have a drink at 5.30 to celebrate the launch of the catalogue. Um, just to let you know where we are with timing, but um, I'll now hand over to Charles. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to chair this panel, a um, panel with Nick Nesbitt and Dick Geary, where we'll be looking at the intellectual legacies of the Haitian Revolution in the immediate post-revolutionary period, thinking particularly about the resonance of the meanings of the revolution for political philosophy. And then with um, Dick, uh, looking at the Lusophone Atlantic, um, in particular thinking about the axis between Haiti and Brazil. And, uh, and uh, it's an area where I think in the UK, in slavery studies in, generally, in, in general, that there's not enough work. So um, I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing uh, what Dick has to say in his paper. Um, I'm going to say a few words uh, in introduction to the session. Then I'll pass over to, um, to Nick, followed by Dick. Around half three, um, the three of us will begin a conversation around the papers and the themes they raise, and then we'll have um, another half an hour or so uh, before we break up at half four uh, to open discussion to the floor and, uh, and, and, and continue those debates. Just a few reflections, though, on the, the theme of this particular session, thinking about legacies and afterlives. The rapid expansion of Haitian historiography over the, the past decade, and I'm thinking sp specifically about the work of a number of French and North American scholars, as well as colleagues in, in Haiti, has progressively and I think convincingly challenged the process that Michel Rovetruyou quite rightly dubbed silencing the past in the book of that title in 1995. New histories of Haiti and of its revolution have reasserted the regional, hemispheric, and global significance an impact of that decade-long struggle led by Toussaint Louverture, by Christophe, by Dessalines. And to that work has been added a number of important studies of other subjects, other periods, and other interconnections in Haitian history, which themselves have hitherto been largely unexplored, or at least underexplored. At the same time, and I think it's worth mentioning this in the context of the exhibition, Haiti has achieved a prominence in popular culture in North America and in Europe, similar to that that it perhaps last enjoyed in the interwar period, following the Harlem Renaissance and following the first US occupation. And we've seen that with Madison Smart Bell's substantial trilogy of novels um, of the revolution, and that's been complemented in music, where we've seen works inspired by the legacies of the revolution by artists as varied as, as Courtney Pine and Wycliffe Jean. And then in the visual arts, in film in particular, there's been for a while talk of Danny Glover's planned biopic of Toussaint, um, which he's planning to make with his own production company, L'Ouverture Films. And a number of you might have seen the forthcoming um, news of the RSC production of Antony and Cleopatra. Um, next year, slated for next year, to be set on the eve of the Haitian Revolution. So we're looking at a time when there's great scholarly cultural interest in Haiti, and that's clearly been supplemented by the persistence of Haiti in the international media. And that's a presence in the media that was particularly um, evident around the time of the aborted celebrations of the Bicentenary of Independence, um, as a result of Aristide's ousting in 2004, but also then as a series of other subsequent events, including the devastating tropical storms in 2004, then in 2008, as well as notably the, the earthquake in January 2010. And what we're seeing now as Haiti's involved in a long process of reconstruction um, is an interest in related events. The presidential elections uh, a year or so ago um, were a subject of close international scrutiny, not least because they were accompanied by the unexpected return of um, Jean-Claude Duvalier and 
Jean-Bertrand Aristide, further evidence of what I think underpins this panel, evidence of the persistence in Haiti of the past within um, the, the present. What's clear within this current interest in Haiti is the persistence of the revolution, either as a direct point of reference or often as evidence of the legacies of what we might call Haiti then, that is, of the historical past, in Haiti now, the contemporary country. And I just wanted to start with a, with a striking example of that. Um, we talked earlier about the second ousting of Jean-Bertrand Aristide in 2004. And there was a particularly interesting moment when Aristide arrived in the Central African Republic. So this was late February 2004, when one of the first things he did when he stepped onto the tarmac at Bongi was to make uh, a speech where he included a key phrase lost on most of the international media, um, but instantly identifiable to a Haitian audience. He said those who had overthrown him had cut down the tree of peace, but he added, it will grow again because its roots are Louverturian. And when you look back through Aristide's public pronouncements, he uses various versions of that speech on a number of occasions. And of course, on, on each of those occasions, he's echoing the words that Toussaint Louverture is supposed to have uttered in 1802, following his ambush by Brunet, before he stepped aboard the Hero for his own transatlantic journey. And James's, CLR James's version of that is, and it's quoted um, in the exhibition upstairs, in overthrowing me, you have cut down only the trunk of the tree of liberty. It will spring up again by the roots, for they are numerous and deep, profonde et nombreuse. I wanted to focus on that example of intertextual resonance in these introductory comments, because for me, it reflects the tenacity of the leaders in the Haitian popular imagination, something, again, that was evoked earlier. But it also reveals something that I think is central to this panel, and that is the competing, even contradictory uses to which the revolution has been put in a variety of different historical, cultural, and geographical contexts. So the aim of the panel is to consider the legacies of the revolution, legacies that we will see are numerous and deep themselves, and of which, as I've said, Nick and Dick are going to offer us two very specific examples. In analysing the political and philosophical resonance of the revolution through a series of afterlives which are often quite closely interconnected, what the panel will stress, I think, is the presence of the revolution in a range of spheres, most notably, and this is clear in Nick's paper, abolitionism, anti-colonialism, anti-racism, but also talking about that presence an understanding we'll have of the complexity, and often, and this will be clear in both papers, I think, the contradictoriness of the legacies of the Haitian Revolution. In terms of analysing those legacies, there's a need to reflect on a variety of different frames, starting with the national, of course, then moving to the regional, then moving to the continental, thinking in many ways about the hemispheric as well in the Americas, shifting into an Atlantic space, and also reflecting on the global or what we might call the, the, the universal as well. And there's also a clear need to acknowledge the very different historical and sociocultural niches in which the afterlives of the revolution are evident. And the final point I'd make is we need to acknowledge, when we're talking about afterlives and legacies, the various vehicles by which the ideas, the spirit, and the meanings of the revolution are freighted. When we're thinking about those issues, frames, niches and vehicles, the starting point, and the exhibition is such a powerful and eloquent reminder of this, the starting point has got to be Haiti itself, where the persistence of the revolution is evident in so many spheres, um, not least what I've mentioned already, political rhetoric, but also, of course, the visual arts. And those of you who have already had the, the, the pleasure of looking at the exhibition um, will see in the, the work selected there the way in which the revolution, and in particular its heroes, featured directly as the subject of works of art, many produced by the history painters of the École du Cap. Beautiful example upstairs of Cynic Aubin's equestrian portrait of, of Toussaint. But and this is probably more important. And it, it, there was discussion earlier of that idea of the resident to which the cultural 
on which a range of other artists draw, not just the history painters. And just, this is divisive, but just one particular example. I was drawn to France Zifferin's painting of the slave ship Brooks. Um, I think it's a particularly clear illustration of that, not least because it includes Toussaint amongst those enslaved Africans around the ship's bow. Two, two, two additional points that I'd like to make about the revolution in Haiti. Um, the first concerns the internal divisiveness that the revolution continues to generate, not only as a result of the models of the and which have often tended towards the dictatorial, but also um, in the way in which it still generates splits between very different Louverturian and Dessalinian interpretations of history and the ideological positions to which they lead. The other point I'd make is about the place of the revolution as a, a privileged foundational event. Now, it's clear, and the conference makes this very clear, that the importance of the revolution cannot be disputed, but it's always got to be understood within that network of other interconnected events. And I'm thinking in particular of the arrival of Europeans in 1942, um, immediately after the revolution, the 1809 land reform, which divided up the large plantations of the colonial period, the US occupation, 1915 to 34, the Duvalier regime, and of course, the, the earthquake of, of um, 2010. All of those, in their own way, were seismic events. But in the wake of the earthquake, there have arisen what I think are very pressing questions regarding the persistence or otherwise of the revolution as a point of reference. That is, is the revolution going to continue in what Gina Ulysse has called very helpfully the new narratives about Haiti? Is it going to persist in those new narratives on which the reconstruction of Haiti will depend? Now, I'm going to leave it to Nick and Dick to, to move beyond that national frame and to, to think about international, transnational, transatlantic, transcontinental um, repercussions. But it, it's always interested me to, to look, even in the 1790s, at the extent to which the, the revolution was already directly seen as a trigger of events elsewhere, not just within the Francophone Caribbean, not just in Guadeloupe and Martinique, um, but also, for example, in the Dutch Caribbean, August 1795, in uh, Curaçao, uh, a, an uprising there, violently suppressed, um, but clearly triggered by the Haitian Revolution, which remains a very important part of the memorial landscape of that island. Um, moving into the early years of the 19th century, 1812, the Aponte Revolution in Cuba, where it's clear through Aponte's Libro de Pinturas, that book of illustrations he had, that the, the Haitian Revolution was serving as a driver for um, revolutionary movements uh, throughout the wider Caribbean. My own work, and I'm not going to have a chance to talk about this in any detail, is, is on something that, that came up in this morning's discussion, the, the way in which Toussaint Louverture operates as a portable but in many ways acceptable vehicle for um, the revolution in contradistinction uh, to Dessalines. Um, and I wanted to finish with, um, this is from the Canto General, from Neruda, who talks about um, Toussaint and says that as a posthumous figure, he permits hidden branches to speak, hopes to be transmitted, the bastion's walls um, to, to rise up. And that, for me, links into an idea that James, C.L.R. James um, mentions in, in the, the 1963 appendix to the Black Jacobins, where he talks about links between the Haitian Revolution and other Caribbean revolutions, and um, doesn't acknowledge, because it's not there, linearity, but talks instead about in a scattered series of disparate islands James writes, the process consists of a series of uncoordinated periods of drift, punctuated by spurts, leaps, and catastrophes. There's that idea of non-linearity, of the, the impact of the Haitian Revolution, its legacies not following any clearly definable patterns. But, he concludes, the inherent movement is clear and strong. And I suppose it was, it was with that idea of the, the inherent movement being clear and strong that I wanted to finish before passing over to, um, to, 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 to Nick and Dick. With Toussaint, when he's taken as an embodiment, a very problematic embodiment of the Haitian Revolution, um, we see within his person debates about post-colonial nationhood and then crucially about neo-colonialism as well, both internal to Haiti but also as a result of the external contact, context of Haiti. Toussaint 
freights, in many ways, the revolution, because he's an inspiration, but at the same time, he's a warning. Um, he's a ma there's a lot of manifest symbolic capital around Toussaint, which is deeply ambiguous. And this is something that's teased out in the work of um, David Scott, who spoke at the Contemporary a few weeks ago, and in particular in his book, um, Conscripts of Modernity, where he builds on an idea that, that Nick himself has explored, that two of the processes that came to distinguish the 20th century were invented in many ways prematurely, 150 years avant la lettre, in Haiti, decolonization and neo-colonialism. Now that tension there between hope of decolonization and what Scott calls the, the tragedy of neo-colonialism, I think it's inherent in analyses of the revolution and, it, and its legacies. And if there is, and this is something that, that Nick has, has written about, um, if there is what we could call an idea of 1804 encapsulating the radical message of universal emancipation, what happens, and I think this is what this panel's about, what happens when that idea travels? Now, one version says that there's dissipation, there's decline, as the revolution is distanced historically and geographically from its point of origin, as it's quarantined in external conditions which blunt its full implications. And that's a quarantining which happens in terms of historiography as well as in terms of international relations. But there's another story, and it's a story that suggests feedback loops. It suggests the reignition of the incendiary impact of the revolution. As a world historical, some people would say, a universal event. Um, to borrow the terms of this morning, as, as, a, as a reservoir of resistance, um, which makes the implications of the revolution clear. Now, and my sense is that those are some of the, the issues that in, 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 in the papers and, and uh, I hope in the, in, in, in the, the discussion that follows them, um, we'll have a, a chance to, to pick up on. It's a real pleasure to introduce um, the first of our two speakers. Um, Nick Nesbitt is Professor of French and Italian at Princeton. Um, he previously taught, and this is where a number of us got to know him well, um, at the University of Aberdeen, um, and was also at Miami University in Ohio. Um, Nick published in 2003 a book called Voicing Memory, History and Subjectivity in French Caribbean Literature, which is a study of Antillean literature and Black Atlantic critical theory. His second book, which a number of you will be familiar with and which is in the, um, the, the, the museum space in the, in, in the reading room next to the museum, again came out with Virginia 2008 and it's called Universal Emancipation, the Haitian Revolution and the Radical Enlightenment. And it, it's a compelling interpretation of the Haitian Revolution in the context of global modernity. I'm thinking about the revolution as a fundamental event in the age of revolution and enlightenment and drawing on key thinkers in contemporary political philosophy. Nick's also the editor of an invaluable little book, and I, I, um, and I, 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 I say that um, in a very positive sense, called Toussaint Louverture, The Haitian Revolution, a collection of Toussaint's writings which came out with Verso in 2008, a really very important resource to have that material available in English. Um, and two years ago, he edited a book with Brian Hulse, Sounding the Virtual, Gilles Deleuze and the Philosophy of Music. He's currently completing a monograph, we're absolutely delighted it's coming out with Liverpool University Press, um, called Caribbean Critique, Antillian Critical Theory from Toussaint to Glisson. And the paper today, you can see here, new title. Oh, the new title is Party <laughs> and the Paradox of Independence. Great, but I'll hand over to Nick, thank you. Thanks so much, Charles, for the kind introduction and to the organizers for the opportunity to join you all here uh, at this extraordinary event and this uh, absolutely extraordinary collection of artwork that we have assembled here upstairs. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me uh, and to be a part of this uh, discussion as well. And if I've changed my title today, uh, it's because I, I wanted to, to uh, focus a bit on the, the same theme, but rather than trying to encompass two centuries uh, in, in 20 minutes, uh, I wanted to narrow things down a bit and, figure, and focus on this one figure of Vati, uh, and particularly in the immediate post-1804 uh, 
independence period. Uh, perhaps tomorrow uh, uh, in our discussion uh, we'll, we'll be thinking as well uh, about the 20th century in a bit more detail uh, and, and the late 19th century. And so I thought it might make sense to, uh, to begin uh, uh, my uh, proposition uh, around this period from 1804 uh, till the death of uh, Christophe, Henri Christophe, in 1820. Uh, and this work that, I'm, that I'll be summarizing here on Vate is uh, something that I've been uh, 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 thinking through recently for a collection that Chris Banji is putting together uh, as both a translation uh, also with Liverpool, a translation of Vate's uh, Système Colonial Dévoilé, the colonial system unveiled, uh, that, com that, that will combine both Chris's translation and introduction with a number of essays, uh, one of which I'm, I've been working on, uh, commenting on Vate in that text in particular, uh, as well as uh, the context of the the larger project that, that Charles just mentioned on Caribbean critique, uh, the, uh, the goal of which is to try to think about uh, Caribbean writing in French as a, a, a critical tradition, a tradition of critique, a tradition of critical theory with its own uh, uh, particular uh, concerns and configurations and interventions and uh, concepts. Uh, and uh, so I think, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this in what follows, that uh, Vate is one of the key, if uh, not the key early uh, uh, thinkers in this tradition. With the fall of the Jacobins, who among their accomplishments in their few months in power had universally abolished slavery in the French Empire on February 6, 1794, the Thermidorian reaction, which was of course composed of the remaining Jacobins, consolidated their oligarchic hold on power and property and privilege through electoral engineering and the so-called white terror. In the wake of Thermidor, which was in its own way perhaps the first uh, gauche caviar, the directory, the rise of Napoleon, and his administration's ever-increasing determination to reimpose slavery upon the peripheral uh, colony, it was revolutionary black Jacobin Saint-Domingue that remained faithful to the revolutionary egalitarianism and the ideals of 1789. Following the defeat of the French and the declaration of Haitian independence in 1804, however, this revolutionary project of universal emancipation and transnational abolitionism was immediately placed in a paradoxical double bind. Across the Atlantic world of economies still fundamentally dependent upon slave-based plantation labor for, ex for the extraction of surplus profit, Haiti's mere existence as a slavery-free state was immensely threatening. And neither France nor the US would extend diplomatic recognition to it for decades to come. France as well actively plotted to reinvade Haiti from the moment of its shocking defeat in 1804 through its eventual extortion of diplomatic recognition in 1825. Following the Bourbon Restoration in April 1814, France made ever increasing threats to reconquer Haiti with a new military invasion in order to reaffirm its hegemony over the territory and to reconstitute plantation slavery, as it had, in fact, in Guadeloupe and Martinique in 1802. And so in this context, the fragile and isolated young Haitian state was forced to, retre to retract any and all claims to export anti-slavery beyond its borders in order merely to consolidate and to preserve the limited, if world historical, accomplishments of the revolution itself, in order, that is to say, to dissuade the Atlantic powers from reinvading in the aim of reimposing plantation slavery. In her book, Modernity Disavowed, Sybil Fisher brilliantly decodes the working through of this paradox of Haitian independence in the dialectic between the explicit anti-intervention clauses in the young state's various constitutions, 
and their more or less implicit subversive offers of a post-racial citizenship to the Atlantic African diaspora. Now, the writings of Henri Christophe's scribe, uh, the anti- and post-colonial theorist and public intellectual Pompey Valentin de Vaté, I want to argue in what follows, are not only another privileged site of response to this direct and very real threat the young country faced, but remain subject to uh, contradictions analogous to those Fisher identifies in the various Haitian constitutions. And indeed, Vate himself explicitly reiter reiterates on a number of occasions similar assurances of non-intervention in his writings. The writings of Baron de Vate, including the 1814 colonial system unveiled, his 1817 political reflections, and the 1819 essay on the causes of the revolution and civil wars of Haiti, undoubtedly comprom uh, comprise a site for the acting out, if not the conscious working through, of this paradox. For Vate, the paradox takes the form of a critique forced to mediate between a violent and uncompromising denunciation of historical slavery, colonialism, and the various contemporary threats to Haiti's fragile independence, and at the same time, the impossibility of articulating a positive political vision in consonance with the universalist anti-slavery that, as Vate himself repeatedly underlines, is the very raison d'etre of the Haitian state. Instead, Henri Christophe's scribe retreats in his writings from a defense of the militant universalist anti-slavery of Louverture and Dessalines to a conservative defense of the independence and mere self-preservation of his country. Black Atlantic universalism, no longer a politics of right, is in Vaté's texts a more constrained, uh, uh, takes on its more constrained discursive modality. A Black Atlantic revoicing, I want to argue, of the Kantian call for a free and global public sphere of enlightenment. I want to suggest that Vaté's writings themselves are structured by a series of such paradoxes. At the level of its intensive rhetoric and ideology, in its vociferous critiques of colonialism, of slavery, of neocolonialism, Vate's logic bears the mark of internal contradictions, including those between Europe and its periphery, of civilization and barbarism, subjection and freedom, while at the same time it's structured from without, in the last instance, and beyond the various uh, particularities of Vate's own stylistic voice by the contradictions of Haitian autonomy itself. These various structural determinations limit the political or ex extensive scope of these texts, limiting, in other words, Vate's political doctrine to the conservation of the fait accompli of Haitian independence, along with the corresponding limitation of Haitian anti-slavery to its discursive and historical rather than transnational, military, or diplomatic recapitulation and the defense of, the Atlantic, of an Atlantic public sphere as the historical memorialization of that inaugural struggle for freedom in Saint-Domingue alone. Le système colonial dévoilé, I should say that not these are the, the images that I've put together are sometimes in dialogue with my own text, uh, not always explicitly uh, linked to it. Uh, here in this famous painting, you want, you want to notice the, uh, the, the uh, sculpture of Reynal, uh, behind which uh, Bellet is, uh, 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 behind Bellet himself. Le système colonial dévoilé pursues a Caribbean tropicalization of the critique of European colonialism initiated by the Haitian Revolution itself. If Vaté's colonial system uh, expands this process of writing back to Europe from its periphery, a process initiated by a series of Atlantic and Black Atlantic critical texts from the 1790s, one might refer back to a series of pre preceding texts in this way, texts critical of racism, of slavery, and colonial violence, such as Diderot's 
critiques of slavery and colonialism in Reynal's Histoire des Deux Indes, or Grégoire's 1808 De la Littérature des Nègres, and the epistolary interventions in the public sphere of the age of revolutions of figures such as Louverture and Dessalines. The letters and proclamations of Louverture of Louis Delcresse, who led the revolt against Napoleon's troops in uh, Guadeloupe in May 1802 and was uh, defeated uh, uh, there, whereupon slavery was reinstituted in Guadeloupe, of Louverture of Delcresse and of Jean-Jacques Dessalines, notwithstanding their brevity and their situated nature, initiated this peripheral critique of slavery and the imperative of its revolutionary destruction by the colonized, uh, a critique that Vatté would develop in his principal works. L'ouverture del Cresse and Dessalines, of course, were involved in revolutionary struggles as soldiers, as politicians, and so the public sphere was thus only one, if nonetheless an essential, arm in their struggle against plantation slavery and colonialism. It's Vati, however, the scribe, as Chris Bangi has called him, and public intellectual in the service of Henri Christophe, who undertakes in his works a sustained critique of plantation slavery and colonialism. Vati explicitly follows on the model of Reynal's Histoire des Deux Andes in calling for a systemic, a global view of colonialism, radicalizing as well that famous text's vehement denunciations of slavery in the famous series of articles penned by Diderot. Vatte articulates a bivalent rhetoric of critique. On the one hand, at certain moments, the author seeks to place himself in abstraction from the empirical immediacy of the experience of slavery and colonialism in order to cognitively map the totality of its function in the, in the Atlantic world of his time. While on the other hand, offering elsewhere in his text detailed and even excruciating testimony to the actual suffering of the enslaved. It's this duality that marks at once the originality and some of the limitations of Vatte's thought and of colonial system unveiled in particular. Vatte, as his title indicates, clearly intuits the system, the systemic nature of colonialism as a global structure. And yet beyond a few scattered reflections such as those I just mentioned, one would look in vain in colonial system for even a moderately detailed description of the operations, forms, and relations of global colonialism. As a sort of quasi-systemic critique, then, Vate envisions colonialism as a homological structure with various multiple modalities that roughly correspond to the colonial spheres of influence, the Spanish, British, French, or Portuguese, spheres, each articulating, articulating distinct colonial systems. And yet when it comes to uh, thinking through the defining characteristics of each of these systems, they in fact in this text turn out to be uh, quite vague features of, that one might uh, attribute to uh, authoritarian systems throughout history. He says, violence, vol, rapine, perfidie, Vati, writing from peripheral Haiti, without major research libraries, intellectual communities of debate and discussion, and above all, time. He, he uh, was killed uh, alongside Christophe in 1820 when that government was overthrown. Uh, he was forced then in the few brief years preceding his death in 1820, in the face of Haiti's ever imminent recolonization and resubjection to slavery, to improvise to improvise a constitutive critique of colonialism and slavery as global systems. In the wake of Vate's premature death, this undertaking would have to await figures such as Eric Williams, C.L.R. James, Sartre Fanon, Emmanuel Wallerstein, and others to carry through a, a formalization of colonialism and slavery and its critique. Marx had the British Library, a European community of socialist thinkers, and above all half a century to begin to construct a, systemic, a systematic and scientific critique of capitalism in the three volumes of Capital. Vate clearly intuits a determining structure beneath the blinding immediacy of colonized experience, but he struggles in his works even to build on the analysis of colonialism 
in Reynal. And he's obliged instead to rely uh, principally on his own firsthand experience in these writings, his experience of slavery, of colonial violence, his participation in the Haitian Revolution, and his experience of French neocolonialism after 1804, as he constructs a post-colonial, a post-colonial critical apparatus that ultimately might be called an ideological war machine rather than a scientific critique. Following the defeat of the Jacobin Republic, its replacement by these, the uh, oligarchies of interest that were Thermidor and the empire, Vati, defender of an embattled Haitian state that dared to stand alone in the Atlantic world of its day in prescribing, proscribing slavery for all human beings, takes up this uh, mantle of the defense of human dignity and freedom in uh, what Kant had already called uh, the public sphere, the global public sphere now. Public opinion, Vate writes himself in his uh, Réflexion Politique, uh, is, quote, the queen that governs the civilized world, calling to her tribunal kings and peoples, dictating to them her impartial and irrevocable judgments, a divine force independent of all human powers, one that spans time and space, embracing the past and future, extending her empire over the universe, unquote, the public sphere. The paradoxical actions of Louverture and Vaté bear, I think, a chiasmic relation. For if Louverture, as C.L.R. James and others have argued, remained tragically faithful to the idea of 1789, to, of the rights of man and justice as equality, even as the actual French nation moved decisively after 1794 toward the reinstatement of slavery, Vaté, one might say, remained faithful instead to the actual slave-free Haitian state. While his structural position as Christophe's scribe obligated him whether in good or bad faith, no matter, to defend the various ancien regime ideologies, uh, to defend various ancien regime ideologies, including hereditary monarchy and its attendant forms of authoritarian inequality. Indeed, one senses that Vati could well have defended any form of government so long as it sustained a slave free state. And he even implies as much when in the Reflexion Politique he writes that, quote, People prosper under every form of government when those who hold the reins are wise, just, enlightened, and forthright. Unquote. A critique of violence is central to Vate's project, distinguishing the unjust terror of slavery from the just Haitian struggle against slavery at all costs from 1791 to 1804. For both C.L.R. James and his precursor Vate, Plantation violence was the site of ultimate horror. Violence, in its most terrible forms, transmuted into a regime, upheld by the rule of codified law, both before and after 1791, until 1794, that is, regularized, standardized, rationalized, and reified. This was the world that continued its horrid existence unchecked in the years after 1789, a regime of ultra-violence rarely unequaled, rarely equaled in human history. Le système colonial dévoilé initiates this critique of colonial violence, a critique that would be carried through by James and uh, France Fanon in particular, uh, thinking in particular of the first chapter, De la violence of the wretched, the wretched of the earth. Vaté's writings as a whole unfold this process as a double movement. First, a powerful condemnation of the utter illegitimacy of colonial domination and its legitimate, lawful violence as uh, the torture of enslaved bodies, while in texts such as the Essay sur les causes de la révolution et des guerres civiles en Haïti, Essay on the Causes of the Revolution, Vaté mounts a vehement defense of the rightful nature of the Haitian destruction of plantation slavery. He writes, in order to destroy this system 
so deeply enrooted by time and prejudice, there were but two methods, either gradually by the will of the oppressors or else despite them, through violent shocks that would necessarily entail a struggle, fraught with crime, blood, and destruction spread across many years. The latter would be sudden, a conflict originating with the oppressed, contrary to the wishes of our tyrants, and engendering a bloody and protracted clash between the oppressed and the oppressors, pregnant with crimes, carnage, and horrors. This is what occurred." Unquote. Christophe's uh, recourse to forced labor was not a personal whim, but was, I'd argue, necessitated by an inevitable real politique to save the gains of the Haitian Revolution, to save what had be already been achieved could only be accomplished in this reading by enacting a defensive strategy that would preserve the gains of the revolution to that point, to avoid a suicidal desire to internationalize its struggle. Suicidal because in a context of general enmity, in this sense parallel to the, encir uh, uh, to the encirclement of Haiti by slaveholding states after 1804, any attempt to internationalize the struggle would have necessarily, sorry, would have unnecessarily antagonized its more powerful, hostile neighbors. The threat against Haiti after 1804 was encirclement. The return of royalist governments after 1814 in France meant a very real threat of invasion, recolonization, re-enslavement. The poverty and underdevelopment of the new Haitian state were, of course, very real social problems, but that same poverty had enormous consequences for the struggle against slavery itself. Haitian poverty made the internationalization of anti-slavery as a practical political agenda after 1804 literally suicidal. In other words, the violence and inequities of Christophe, however one might judge them ultimately, excuse me, in one sense, the betrayal of the universalist revolution itself were a consequence not, or at least not only, of a personal struggle for power, but would never have occurred, one might argue, had the US and France uh, stood as partners in the fight against slavery rather than its declared enemies. Vate's writings mark out this ambiguous status of Caribbean critique in the wake of 1804 divided between a retrospective fidelity to anti-slavery and universal emancipation and the often contradictory demands of an embattled state and monarch placed upon the scribes, including Vati, in their employ. Anti-slavery after 1804 no longer stood for the entirety of the struggle to end slavery, but came to signify the intermediary state between an idealistic abolitionism and the fully instantiated reality of a slavery-free global order. Vati's texts are drawn between this contradiction. Haitian anti-slavery was in fact one of the great successes of the modern era, a world historical revolution that despite this initial quarantine would decisively and actually transform the world system of slave-based labor over the course of the 19th century with the various abolitions of 1838, 1848, 1865, and others uh, uh, following in its wake. But this triumph of global anti-slavery after 1804 was to a large extent no longer a Haitian struggle. These paradoxes informing Vate's critique of colonialism and slavery bear, uh, as I've argued, uh, intensive and extensive dimensions. Voicing of violence bestialization of slavery, Vate inaugurates a tradition of Caribbean critique that will culminate in texts such as Aimé Césaire's Discours sur le colonialisme and Fanon's Dané de la Terre. Because of his scribal position, however, and unlike uh, uh, the more freestanding positions of uh, Césaire, I would argue, but above all Fanon, uh, and his participation in the Algerian Revolution, neither of whom were committed to defending the politics of an existent state from which they gained their livelihood, let alone defending a hereditary monarchy, 
Vati is obliged to uphold the inherent iniquities of the monarchic system and Christoph's authoritarian state. It's not so much in this reading the concept of universality that's paradoxical. Monarchy and forced plantation labor, I'd argue, are fundamentally inegalitarian and unlike various models of popular democracy, by definition, render universal justice as equality impossible. Rather, the absolute commitment to preserving the gains of 1804 in a global context hostile to the continued existence of the Haitian state drove both Christophe and his scribe into the defense of the paradoxical notion of anti-slavery in one state, and to resort, like Louverture before them, to forced labor in defense of an impoverished, economically dysfunctional state that assured that order. Seen from the level of the extent, extensive structural paradoxes of the post-1804 Atlantic world informing Vati's thought, Christophe's scribe should, I would argue, by way of conclusion, be grasped as a key figure in a tradition of critique extending from Kant to Foucault. Indeed, it's not only the shared commitment to enlightenment that unites these thinkers. And I should say in a longer version of this uh, paper, uh, uh, I spend quite a, a bit of time going through the text of uh, Colonial System Unveiled uh, because uh, there are various forms of enlightenment discourse and, and the very concept of enlightenment uh, and a, uh, 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 a universal civilization that are fundamental to Vati's own uh, logic. So for Kant, uh, enlightenment, of course, entailed an escape or a sortie, as Foucault notes in his famous exegesis of Kant's What is Enlightenment? Uh, an escape from a subject's minority. Vate's model of enlightenment envisages an analogous break, above all from the bestialization of slavery and colonialism into a universal becoming civilized. Vate, it might be argued, implicitly scores throughout his works a tropical injunction analogous to Kant's, argue as much as you will and about whatever you will, but obey, unquote, that's Kant. Vate says something like, implicitly, support the regime of the Haitian state as legitimate raison d'état insofar as it institutes a slave-free society and do so regardless of its institutional form and secondary degrees of authoritarianism and inequity. And do so, moreover, without offering a positive doctrine of emancipation for the present and future, insofar as the expression of such a doctrine would endanger the actual preservation of the gains of 1804, and remain, uh, remain content merely to voice the injustice of colonialism and slavery retrospectively in a strictly non-interventionist public sphere. The doctrine of universal militant black Jacobin emancipation, in other words, that Louverture freely and publicly expressed becomes unutterable after 1804. For Kant and Vati alike, power is always state power. Right is always the right to preserve property, including the preservation of ourself as property. With critical discourse in a free public sphere of expression, a rhetoric, a rhetoric of the critique of violence, whether it's the threat to human dignity for Kant or the violence of slavery and colonialism for Vati, without a corresponding emancipationist politics. If for Kant, politics as the preservation of property rightfully culminates in his reading in the conservative Thermidorian regime as the revolutionary defense of bourgeois property, for Vati, property is firstly that of our person, our person in its slavery-free dignity, and consequently, its political modality, the conservative preservation of the independence of the political nation, Haiti, as our property, as subjects of 1804, as the lone state that assures the preservation of human freedom from slavery. Unlike Fanon or Césaire, to conclude, Vate articulates no positive political doctrine for the present, his present, beyond such a preservation of independence as rightful property. 
any politics of universal truth as equal justice for all human beings is, in his writings, strictly relegated to the past as the event, 1804, that founds the present state of law under Christophe in its absolute legitimacy. Only critical public sphere discourse exists in this logic as a rightful present force standing in subtraction from state power rather than, say, transnational anti-slavery or popular revolution. This most radical figure of Haitian autonomy paradoxically inscribes the forced retreat of Louverture and Dessalines' politics of universal emancipation to the defense of the freedom of the press and the global public sphere. With Henri Christophe, celebrated in Vat as Vatte's, quote, immortal protector of the freedom of the press, unquote. Vatte, scribe and post-colonial theorist, thus stands in a world still dominated by plantation slavery as the guarantor of the freedom to recall the horrors of colonial Saint-Domingue and to defend the world historical import of the Haitian revolutionary struggle and its destruction of global colonialism. He does so, however, as a citizen of a state tragically shorn of the means to pursue this struggle in a black Atlantic world that would remain largely under the yoke of slavery for decades to come. Thanks. Um, Nick, thank you for a, a, a fascinating and a very subtle paper, which is, has really covered a lot of ground. I think what was very important for me there was that work of recovery of intellectual history, um, particularly the intellectual history in the immediate aftermath of the, of, of, of the revolution. And what you really evoked there quite clearly were the conditions of the production of knowledge and the, the condition of those, the, those debates um, in Haiti un, under Christophe. Um, during a period of civil war where there's this very clear sense of, of isolation and th there's real pro geographical um, considerations and, and political issues to, to bear in mind. Then you led us very clearly um, to think about the place of, of Haiti in wider genealogies of post-colonial thought and associated critique. And I, I think part of that, and this is where you came to in many ways at the end of the paper, was the invitation to, to reflect on intellectual legacies of the revolution, the, the context of their generation, but also um, the, not quite lineages, but the, the, the series of debates and identification of interlocutors that, that were there, and, and, and to think through the links from um, Vatte to Césaire to Fanon and to James is for me um, particularly evocative. So, Thank you very much. We, we, we'll pick up a number of those issues, uh, I'm sure, in the discussion and the questions. It's a real pleasure now to introduce our second speaker in the panel, um, Dick Geary. Um, Dick is the former director of the Institute for the Study of Slavery at the University of Nottingham. Uh, he's very well known. He's an extremely eminent European labor historian. Um, his main field of research is the European labor movement, but also the intellectual history of Marxism. But in more recent years, he's been working on questions of slave labor and unpaid work uh, in Brazil, but also in Western Europe, emphasizing questions of ideology, religion, and ritual. Um, Dick is currently Emeritus Professor of Modern History at the University of Nottingham. Uh, he's very recently edited with Stephen Hodkinson um, a book called Slaves and Religions in the Ancient World and Modern Brazil, which I think in many ways underlines one of um, Dick's working methods, which is often comparative, en enlighteningly comparative. And he's also um, currently finishing um, a book with uh, what for me is a very evocative title, Atlantic Revolution or Local Difficulty, which I think seems to encapsulate a number of the, the issues that, uh, that, 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 that Nick was talking about as well. Atlantic Revolution or Local um, Difficulty, Africa, Europe and Revolt in Brazil, 1780 to 1850. And that is um, an attempt to compare the struggles of subaltern groups 
in slave and non-slave societies. So it, it's a real pleasure to introduce Dick for the paper today, which is entitled The Contradictory Legacy of Haiti, the Slave Revolt in Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that uh, the advent of Nottingham Contemporary in Nottingham has been wonderful in all kinds of ways, not least for staging this kind of conference. And I'm pleased to say that the Institute for the Study of Slavery at Nottingham was in fact involved in the very first event that uh, this institution organized, which was on the subject of lace and slavery. So I hope the cooperation will continue the Institute at the University of Nottingham uh, continues uh, under the directorship of my colleague Steve Hodkinson, who works on slavery in the ancient world. Um, before I say anything else, I should also now make two apologies. The first uh, to everybody is that I'm very sorry I can only be around for this particular session. And secondly, that I absolutely have to flee at 4.30 for reasons that I won't bore you with. Uh, I should also apologise for the fact that I know relatively little about Haiti, which doubtless will become very clear to the many people here who know a great deal uh, about it. Okay. But the paper is, is basically using, to some extent, what I discovered in working on slave revolt in Brazil to understand Haiti, and in particular, to reinstate Africa, because a lot of the discourses that we hear about the Haitian Revolution are fundamentally Eurocentric, Enlightenment generated. I'll explain why that in a minute. <clears throat> For as long as they've been slavery, which basically means forever, slaves have sought to deal with their enslavement in a variety of ways by developing various sorts of what I would call survival strategies. Some of those strategies essentially aim at accommodation with the slave owners, uh, behaving, doing things well so that you get immediate uh, rewards in the daily existence. They can, if very successful, however, lead in some slave societies to manumission, that is to say the granting of freedom to slaves by their masters. And in Brazilian and Cuban society, slave societies in particular, there are significant numbers of slaves who adopt these strategies because the possibility exists of the purchase of their freedom, which is something that makes the situation very different, for example, to the French and the British Caribbean and to North America, where manumission is extremely unusual and purchase manumission virtually non-existent. And indeed, manumission becomes even less likely after Haiti than it actually was uh, before. So some slaves adopt strategies of accommodation. Others, much more relevant to uh, today's discussions, adopt strategies of resistance. And these strategies of resistance could be individual, from feigned illness and weeping to theft, arson, suicide, abortion, and infanticide. In fact, gynecological resistance is something that's been written about quite widely uh, in the Caribbean, but is also now being studied in, in Brazil. I don't have time to say any more about that, but I'd welcome questions in that kind of area. Of course, physical attacks on owners and the agents of owners, individual acts of disobedience and arson were far from unknown, although such acts were much more uh, successful where they were actually collective, which made punishment much more difficult. Individual flight was common, that is to say slaves running away from their masters, and slaves run away from their masters for a whole variety of reasons. Often, in fact, that flight from a plantation or other form of slave occupation uh, might mean little more than visiting friends and family, and in most owners actually learnt to tolerate that. Sometimes collective flight involved putting pressure on slave owners to improve working conditions, if you like, it's a primitive form of strike. We have one example from Brazil specifically where we have a list of the demand, the document with the list of demands the slaves made when they left the plantation and said, we'd only come back if you 
A, let us drum more and enjoy ourselves. Uh, B, work longer periods of time on our own plots of land, very important to many slaves and enabled some to accumulate uh, capital. Some forms of bargaining resemble Luddism in the UK, and incidentally, I understand Luddism not as mindless machine smashing, but a form of, uh, of violent collective bargaining in the absence of strikes and, and legality of strike action. Um, Osborne once described uh, Luddism as economic bargaining by riot, and I think that actually also to some extent characterises, for example, acts of arson by slaves, the laming of animals and the destructions of tools, because if you didn't do that, the slave owner could bring in more slaves simply to replace those who'd actually uh, left the plantation. Uh, another form of collective action was collective flight and the establishment of colonies of fugitive slaves, what were known as maroon societies, or quilombos in, uh, in Brazil. And of course, most explosively, slaves could rebel. They could engage in armed uprisings against their, uh, their masters. Now again, slave rebellions are nothing new. Indeed, from the moment that slaves were connected in entrepots in so-called barracoons on the west coast of Africa for transportation uh, to places like Brazil, there, there were a number of risings uh, against uh, their enslavement. There were also uh, various kinds of insurrections on slave ships, uh, some of which are extremely well known. In the Americas, slave revolts, as far as we can see, certainly already existed as early as 1522, when African slaves massacred their masters in the city of Santo Domingo. Fifteen years later, slave conspiracy was discovered on, amongst uh, 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 slaves in Mexico City. In 1540, slave fishermen on the island of Santa Margarita uh, rose against their owners. The copper mines uh, of Peru and the silver mining camps of northern Mexico in the 17th century were characterized by numerous slave rebellions, and there were aborted plots and revolts in Barbados, in 1649 and 1675. In the 18th century, all major urban centers uh, of, the, of Latin America and the Caribbean ex experienced slave revolts. One in New York City, for example, in 1712. Guyana was locked in a series of struggles between slaves uh, and uh, the authorities in the, 17th, from the, in the 1720s to the 1770s. And perhaps most famously of all, in Jamaica. Jamaica was characterized by maroon wars, wars between the authorities and uh, seas of, uh, of uh, fugitive slaves. And interestingly enough, in the case of Jamaica, which was also the case in Suriname, uh, the authorities were not able militarily to defeat the runaway slaves, so they actually uh, concluded treaties with the runaway slaves. These treaties are interesting for a number of reasons, and one of the reasons is that they rather destroy images of, uh, of, uh, of uh, romantic images of slave solidarity, because the treaties the Maroons signed said, we promise not to take, we promise to return any more runaway slaves. Whether they did or not was, was, was a matter of some uh, debate. But so, slave rebellions are nothing new. But Haiti, Saint-Domingue, as the island was known while still under French rule, Haiti was something new. It was, of course, the first time that coloreds and blacks had overthrown white colonial, well, not only colonial, white government, full stop. It was the first occasion when a slave revolt had led to independence from a colonial power. And it had an absolutely massive impact. I have no doubt, I have no problem with that traditional narrative or what we've heard uh, so far. But there are forms of the narrative about Haiti, in particular that link it to the French Revolution and Enlightenment philosophy, which seem to me to be problematical for a variety of reasons I'll explain in a moment. What I want to do first of all, though, is to some extent give an account of that traditional narrative 
of the Haiti uh, Revolution. Um, French Revolution and the subsequent revolutionary upheavals in Saint-Domingue, Haiti, between 1791 and 1804, have been seen as inaugurating a dramatic change in the nature of slave revolts. According to Eugene Genovese, the great American uh, historian, sadly recently deceased, quote, the conquest of state power by representatives of the consolidating bourgeoisie in France decisively transformed the ideological and economic terrain and provided the conditions in which a massive revolt in Saint-Domingue, Haiti, could become a revolution in its own right. It marked a turning point in the history of slave revolts and indeed of the human spirit. Henceforth, slaves increasingly aim not at secession from the dominant society, but at joining it on equal terms. And Genovese continues, by the end of the 18th century, the historical content of slave revolt shifted decisively to attempts to secure freedom from society, from slavery, to attempts to overthrow slavery as a social system. And he sees this as, uh, as evidenced by the fact that the revolt in Haiti did not aspire to restore some lost African world or build an isolated Afro-American enclave. Rather, slave revolts were now inspired by a, his quote, modern ideology, by the universalist claims of the rights of man, rather than an Afro-American religious call to holy war. And this transition, he, like Michael Creighton, associates with the transition from American, uh, Af sorry, from African dominated to Creole-led slave revolts. When I use the word Creole in this context, it means a slave who is born in the new world. I mean, in, in slave who's born in Jamaica, a slave who's born in, in, as distinct from slaves born in Africa. Now, I have no doubt that the events in Haiti are historically unparalleled. It is equally clear that they were in all kinds of ways structurally dependent upon France and the French Revolution. Their ability to seize power is tied to the wars and upheavals unleashed by the French Revolution. And what Toussaint was able to do was to exploit the space created by almost 20 continuous years of colonial struggles between France, Spain and Britain, between metropolitan France and colonial whites, and between whites and mulattoes on the island to create a disciplined army of slaves and end their servitude. And Toussaint and the other leaders exploited uh, these possibilities with the most extraordinary, and I would also add a completely unscrupulous brilliance, uh, involved changing sides many, many times. Moreover, the attempt, the Napoleonic attempt to restore slavery to the island recreated the, the alliance between African and Creoles, which had otherwise been severely fractured, and I'll say more about that uh, in a minute. Secondly, in terms of linkages to France and French legacies, there is absolutely no doubt that the intellectual provenance of Toussaint's views was located in the ideas of the French Enlightenment and Revolution. And indeed, he and, of course, several of the other leaders had actually studied in and been in France as well as, uh, as the island. Toussaint deployed the vocabulary of French citizens. He detested voodoo as on Christian superstition, something to which I'll return. And in his famous letter of the 5th of November, 1797, to the directorate, Toussaint spoke of, quote, the sublime morality of the French. He wanted liberty and equality to rule in Saint-Domingue. It was also French troops which brought to the island in 1794 news that the assembly had abolished slavery. And when Napoleon sent troops to restore that hated institution, Haiti's blacks responded not only with force of arms, but according to some reports, by singing the Marseillaise and Saïra, French revolutionary anthems. It is, of course, equally clear, as we've already heard, that slave success in Saint-Domingue had a profound effect on other slave societies. The movements of sailors and troops around the Caribbean and coastal areas of the Americans spread news of black victories. The role of of slave sailors is absolutely crucial in terms of the transmission of news of revolt. At a time, also what happened at the same time was that several white emigre landowners from Haiti took their slaves with them to new uh, positions in the rest of the new world. And that some of these slaves 
dragged from Saint-Domingue, from Haiti to America, then participated in, in uprisings in their new uh, situations. This was true in Jamaica in 1799, for example. The revolt in Saint-Domingue, as is well known, was followed by upheavals in St. Lucia, Guadeloupe, and Martinique, a slave rising in Tortola, and a mass exodus of slaves from plantations in Cayenne in the 1790s. In 1795, rebellious slaves in Venezuela are reported to have based their claims to freedom on, quote, the law of the French, the Republic, and to have demanded liberty for slaves. There are further reports of Trinidadian slaves uh, wearing tricolours and singing the Marseillaise. Uh, according to C.L.R. James, what happened in Haiti destroyed black free, uh, feelings of inferiority forever. As Herbert Klein writes, as for the slaves of America, the Haitian Revolution provided a vital example of a movement for freedom which could succeed against all the odds. In all American societies, the black and mulatto workers, free and slaves, were inspired by the Haitian Revolution. And Genovese also reply, uh, uh, mentions uh, several uh, other uh, examples of the influence of the French Revolution on revolts, various revolts in the United States. To move now to Brazil, it is also true that there were a whole series of conspiracies, or what were called in confidencia, in the country between 1780 and 1850, which in part owed their origin to various modern or Western ideologies. Now, I have a long list of these in which French Enlightenment philosophers and in which Haiti are actually mentioned, but I don't really have time to look at those in uh, any detail. But, and this is where my problems start, if you like, where I become a sort of party pooper, is that... If you look at references to Haiti and the accusation that slave revolts in Brazil were explained, inspired by the example of Haiti, then you start having problems. Um, a whole a large body of work by Juan José Hayes and Flavio Santos Gomes, two very famous Brazilian uh, historians of slavery, um, their work actually shows that mention of Haiti was much more often on the lips of the slave owners and the authorities than it was on the lips of rebellious slaves themselves. Not only that, but most of the references to Haiti are found in movements of mulattoes and creoles and not of African slaves. And in slave revolts, Hayes can only find one example of a specific reference to Haiti. So what is going on? It seems to me that arguments about the penetration of radical Western values in slave societies begin to break down in various ways when we look at uh, those movements which explicitly claimed a debt to Haiti and the Enlightenment. Apart from two particular uh, conspiracies uh, in Brazil, Virtually all the inconfidencias, conspiracies rising, which weren't specifically revolts of African slaves, virtually all of these mobilized only a small number of people, mainly from the social and intellectual elite. And very rarely were slaves involved. When slaves were involved, they tended overwhelmingly to be Creole. Slaves born in Brazil were often craftsmen, or recruited from slaves in superior positions. Some Creoles did become involved in numerous Republican, independence, and separatist movements in Brazil. And some of these subsequently became involved in the abolitionist movements and in various kind of liberal and, as it were, Western ideological movements. But this was not true of the overwhelming majority of the slaves who rose in revolt in Brazil, and there are a very large number of revolts in Brazil in the first half of the 19th century. Um, to quote Stuart Schwartz, the strongly ethnic character of many of the revolts, organized as they were by various African peoples, 
and the divisions of color, status, and origin within the Afro-Brazilian communities argue against a unifying theme of ideological Jacobinism amongst the slaves. That kind of more inclusive political thinking and the example of France seem to be more important in the republican political movements of the period than in, that involved free people of color. And in fact, in general, the slave owners and the authorities in Brazil seem to have been right when they claimed that rebellion was very much in Brazil African and that it largely omitted uh, uh, Creoles. In fact, Creoles participated in none of the over 30 revolts or conspiracies in Bahia in the first half of the 19th century. Bahia is one of the major uh, states in the Brazilian uh, northeast, uh, Salvador, its capital. So that raises some interesting questions because you might imagine that things in what was so different in Haiti? Uh, well, one of the answers to that, at least, is in fact that they weren't so different in Haiti. And that is to say that the tensions and different forms of behavior of Creoles and slaves, I don't, I don't want to make this say that always exists, because it doesn't. But there were similar tensions in the course of the revolution in Haiti. The vast majority of the slaves who rose on the northern plain of Saint-Domingue in 1791 came from Africa. They spoke, in the words of Jean-Francois, one of the revolutionary leaders, not a word of French. And what you detect in his accent, and those of some of the other leaders, is something fairly close to problematical attitudes towards African slaves, and especially the values and beliefs of African slaves. Uh, as I've already said, um, according, according to James, voodoo was the medium of the, of the revolution. But in fact, uh, Toussaint, of course, condemned it as on Christian su uh, uh, superstition. What I'm really trying to say is the final settlement that takes place in Haiti, namely the erection of uh, a, a regime of militarized agriculture in which the labor of supposedly liberated former slaves originally controlled and their access to, to, to freedom tenuous. I don't think that was simply a function of the need to preserve the revolution, although that's certainly part of it. What I'm trying to say is there are kinds of tensions and conflicts of values between African and Creole slaves that you can even find in the case of, of Haiti. However, things like the Napoleonic invasion and attempts to restore slavery in the island created forms of unity between these different groups. Those forms of unity very rarely happened in Brazil. I could give you lots of examples of any number of rebellions in Brazil by Africans. Many, in fact, of Africans who were Islamic. Um, and their ideological mentors and their ideological inspiration comes very much from Africanized Islam and not from Western ideologies or, for that matter, from uh, Haiti. And that raises then the question, why are these conflicts so much more marked in Brazil, say, than in many or some other slave societies? Part of the answer has to do simply with, and this, in this sense, Brazil re resembles Saint-Domingue on the eve of the revolution, partly because Brazil imported so many Africans. 40% of all Africans transported from Africa to the New World between 1650 and 1850, 40%, nearly not that much less than half, went to Brazil. That is about 10 times as many as went to the US. It's almost as many as North America and the Caribbean combined. Not only that, but the importation of Africans in Brazil continued until 1850, whereas in the North Atlantic, things changed quite dramatically after the 1807-1808 legislation uh, in the United Kingdom. In fact, between 1815 and 1848, something like two million Africans were imported into Brazil, which meant that African culture was constantly rejuvenated 
and that differences between Africans and, uh, and others amongst the slave community uh, were in some ways much more marked. There is another, I think, fact which explains some of the difference. And that is that in Brazil, even in 1650, a majority of slaves did not work on plantations. Even in 1650, slaves occupied virtually every occupation in agriculture and virtually every occupation in manufacture and industry and in transport. Half the crews of Brazilian slave ships were in fact made up of slaves, which is interesting and leads one to ask certain kinds of questions. What this meant was that many slaves in Brazil were what the Brazilians called negros de ganho. That is to say, these were slaves who were owned by a master to whom they paid so much a week, but then hired themselves out in the labor market and accumulated capital. And those slaves could actually sometimes purchase their freedom. Manumission in Brazil was about 16 times more common than in the US. Uh, that's according to Bob Slenis's figure. Now, I don't want to romanticize manumission in Brazil. First of all, it's only a minority of slaves who ever get it. Secondly, manumission is often conditional. That is to say, you are granted your freedom, but only if you work for so long uh, for the offspring of the owner or until the owner dies. And also the evidence is overwhelming that the great majority of manumissions in Brazil were purchased. That is to say, slaves bought that freedom. Uh, and that's even true in the case of female African slaves. Female African slaves were manumitted in quite large numbers. And one can assume, I think, that that was less because of sexual relations between them and their masters, but given they purchased their freedom because African women dominated retail and market activities in Brazil and could accumulate some degree of capital. So what we have is a situation, first of all, in which there are very large numbers of Africans, but secondly, in which some slaves can look forward to a route out of freedom without resistance and without insurrection. And what is important to know in this context uh, is that it was not Afri it's very rarely African males who were ever manumitted. So Creole slaves in Brazil had roots out of slavery which didn't include the very dangerous activity of insurrection. For African males, that opportunity didn't uh, actually exist. And what, what I think clinches that particular argument is that there are one or two places in Brazil where Creoles and slaves rebel together. That's true, for example, in some of the coffee planting areas in the 1830s and 1840s. But there were two things about those areas. First of all, the Creole slaves in those areas were first generation. They hadn't been away from Africa. Their parents had definitely come from Africa. But secondly, the chances of manumission and coffee plantation areas were virtually nil. So those Creoles found themselves in situations that were analogous to those of Africans. So I'm not trying to say that there's anything necessary about conflict between Creoles and African slaves, but I'm saying that in Brazil's specific circumstances meant that those divisions, and in particular the ability of certain groups of slaves to purchase their freedom, made a very fundamental difference to prospects of solidarity. And that becomes even more complex when you realize that many former and freed slaves in Brazil themselves, themselves become slave owners. Very unromantic story. But what is interesting is in the state of Minas Gerais, for example, in the, in the 18th century, two thirds of all the wills of former slaves who had been freed actually include at least one slave in their property. So this is a social structure of slavery which is utterly unlike anything in uh, Sound of Man. Sorry I've spoken uh, for too long, but there are lots of areas I'm sure that you'll want to ask about. Thank you. Thank you.